Well, greetings, imagination connoisseurs. Once again, it is I, your Duke of Dope Discourse, your master of fun and wonder, your viceroy of verisimilitude, Robert Meyer Burnett, or if you prefer, what John Campia himself once called me, the existential Mr. Rogers, and welcome to another episode of Mailbag. This one, I'm flying solo, so you're going to have to bear with me. Very excited to be here. You know I love hearing from you guys, girls, gentle beings, kind souls, however you identify, and we're just going to jump right into it and find out what is on your minds. We're going to start with Nosferatu. So I'm super confused. If Luke was following the rule of no attachment f- attachments for the new Jedi Academy, why did he agree to train Leia, who was already married to Han? who left the Jedi path because she had a hard time controlling her fear. Plot hole? Hmm. Good question, Nosferatu. You know, I would say this. I think that Luke was helping her explore her Force adept powers, but I don't think she was going to become a Jedi. But Luke was equipping her with the ability and knowledge to tap into the Force in case she needed it. So she wasn't going to be a full-fledged Jedi because she was a statesman, a leader or a state's person, I suppose, and um, it would just uh, allow her to have something else to fall back on in case the going gets tough and the shit came down. She was going to be able to use Jedi powers. At least that's the kind of way I would I would see it. I think you've actually brought up a really great plot point, but in my own way, I think I've just, in my own head, I would I would define it that way, I think. Uh, Kamada says, I met Pennywise himself, Bill Skarsgård, as he was rehearsing the scene of the Paul Bunyan statue. He was so nice and generous to come over and chat and sign autographs for fans. I've got a picture of him less than three feet away, but I didn't get an autograph. Man, you are a braver person than me. I don't think I'd go anywhere near that dude. Pennywise is very scary, especially in It Part 1. But I'm glad you had a good experience. Uh Uh-oh. Kamada goes one out of seven. A seven-part question. I'll try and deal with this in the best of my to the best of my ability. Now on to other topics surrounding the movies. I recently acquired the extended edition of the Lord of the Rings trilogy to rewatch in anticipation for the new series. Can't wait to watch it. But in your topic of discussion surrounding extended editions and uh oh, there's no the part two of your question is missing. I'm gonna have to fill it in. By the way, I hope you got the versions on Blu-ray that have all of the special features, because I worked on those. So, um, but in your topic of discussion surrounding extended editions and something's missing, was cut from the theatrical version. That still baffles me to this day. Other scenes that were cut were not essential, but some were. What do you and Rob think about if the scene of a movie is essential in character and story, but is cut out of the theatrical release? But the Gondor calls for aid and Rohan shall answer. Still one of the greatest fist-pounding lines in cinematic history. But with now having Amazon, Apple TV, HBO Max, Crave, and Netflix, I'm making sacrifices with these services, not mentioning Peacock, stupid name, and Paramount+. Plus. Do you think that when we can no longer afford all of them, we will be switching back and forth as things come out? Finally, John, Peacemaker, one of the greatest things I've seen. And if you want me to send a video of the dance, I can dance. Laugh out loud. Please do. Please send a video of the dance. I've got a, I've got a great in the last little while as I watched a list of over 20 from... Fr- oh, let's see. I've got a great list in the last while as I've watched a list of over 20 from Free Guy, John Wick, Quiet Place 2, Suicide Squad, Nobody, The Expanse, The Boys, For All Mankind Season 2, and... I agree with Rob. Best hour of TV in a long time. Did you finish season two, John? Well, first of all, uh, Kamada, I'm going to, I hope I'm getting that right. Is it Kamada? I think Kamada, because it's like Canada, but Kamada. Uh, Let's go back. Um, You're asking about the Lord of the Rings extended editions and about which scenes are cut and which scenes are not and which scenes are essential and which scenes are not. I really think that the extended editions of the Lord of the Rings movies, having worked on the special features and heard Peter Jackson talk about this, I think the extended editions of the Lord of the Rings movies are, in fact, the definitive editions. But I'm going to tell you something. I actually like the theatrical version of Return of the King more than the extended version, but I do like the extended version of Fellowship and um, Two Towers better. I think those are better. So take that 
and uh, make of it what you will. But I think the great thing about the Lord of the Rings is because they're, they come from literary sources, I think all of the extended edition footage deepens our understanding of the characters and uh, has us respect the story more. Even, I mean, there are things you don't necessarily need, but I really do think that sometimes there are things that are plot-driven and there are other things that are character-driven. In the case of the Lord of the Rings movies, I think the extended uh, scenes are really essential to enhance your understanding of the movie. So I think that's great. Now, in terms of all of your... Uh, you, you bring up a good point about getting all of the um, these streaming services and it's going to get expensive. You know, I, th I think more and more we're going to be subscribing to streaming services and unsubscribing based on things that we really like. Like Apple Plus, I, I don't know if I necessarily need it, but I need it for all mankind. And some uh, when season one was over, I unsubscribed and then subscribed back when season two came out. I think it's just going to get too expensive. And there's so many, there's so much great programming now. Um, I think more and more people are going to do that until they get wise. And maybe they're going to say you can't do that. I don't know how they're going to do that. Uh, remember, send us a video of you dancing. And um, I'm sorry we're missing the second part of your question. I, I, I know I'm probably missing out here. But I love the list of movies you've watched. Free Guy, John Wick, Quiet Place 2, Suicide Squad, Nobody, The Expanse, great series, The Boys for All Mankind. I think you're watching some great stuff there. And, I mean, I am so glad you feel that way about the end of Season 2 of For All Mankind because Season 2, a lot of it was more earthbound and it was more character drama than action. But, my God, did it stick the landing. You needed that buildup. Those last couple of episodes, and especially the second and the, the second, the penultimate and the final episode were two of the finest hours I've seen in years. They were so good. Oh my gosh, did I love them. Alexander sends in a tip and says, Hey John and Rob, am I the only one that isn't keen on Tom Cruise's Iron Man? I just don't feel hyped for Tom Cruise as supreme Iron Man. Also, wouldn't it be hilarious if it is James McAvoy's Professor X just with a Patrick Stewart voice? Been fooled again, laugh out loud. Um, Here's the thing. I understand where you're coming from. I think Tom Cruise playing Superior Iron Man or Supreme Iron Man, if it's not done well, it, it, first of all, we don't know if that's going to happen. But if it did, I'd be there for it. But if it's not done well, yeesh. I wouldn't like that. Would not dig it. Um, so I hope it is done well. Um, but I understand where you're coming from because the real question is, would would the Tom Cruise nature... Like, I'm a huge Tom Cruise fan. I've been a Tom Cruise fan since I saw Risky Business in 1983. Actually, since I saw Taps or The Outsiders, too. But he really broke through in Risky Business, and I've loved him ever since. I think he's a great actor, and he's he really gives it his all. But... You know, when I when I, Robert Downey Jr. became Tony Stark, and I would hope that Tom Cruise he has the the ability to do that, but I I I wouldn't want it I wouldn't want it to be like oh I'm watching Tom Cruise doing a version of Iron Man I'd like to see just Superior Iron Man and not think to myself oh it's Tom Cruise it really depends so jury's out we'll see what happens. Uh, Motasim 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 says first. Uh, hello, first time tipper. Well, welcome and thank you for supporting the channel. Uh, I think I got your name right. Uh, I th it's Motasim. I think Mot M O T Motasim. Hello, first time tipper. Been watching since One Division. Nice, big fan of the John Campy show. I was curious if you saw that official Marvel video of Kevin Feige showing the alternate post-credit scene of Iron Man One, where Fury mentioned to Tony that mutants were around. I believe I have seen that. But in the movie, he didn't mention mutants. What if it was at that point when Fury was talking to Tony that Wanda, wherever she was, altered reality and the mutants were no longer there? Just a theory I thought I'd share and thanks to all you do. I love that idea. I love that idea. Not only that, but they could use both of those scenes in Doctor Strange and actually create a flashback scene and that dude that's a dope idea um i love that idea i i hope it happens that'd be very cool 
Sam Edwards sends in a tip and says, Theory, Professor X is giving Strange his dreams of what turns out to be Wanda destroying multiverses, leading Strange to him and the Illuminati as some sort of call for help to bring back the mutants. You know what? I, the more people throw, out, throw these ideas out, Sam, I am so there for that. I love this idea. That that's part of what this what's going on here is that the multiverse. Wouldn't it be interesting that a lot of this reality fracturing is a result of Wanda changing reality? I love this idea. I think this is all great stuff. And the thing is, she only changed our reality, the reality of the MCU. But in doing so, she, there were ripples into the multiverse or something. I love this idea. I think it's great. Captain Brett says, what if? During Multiverse of Madness, Wanda says, bring them back. Returning the mutants to the MCU. Then our post credit scene, we hear a doorbell ring and old Steve Rogers opens the door to his home and simply says, Logan? <laughs> Dude, this is the best. Captain Brett, yes. See, I'm getting chills. I, I All of these ideas are great. Love them all. I am totally in. I mean, I would love to see that. You do say, what if? What if? I, I Look, I'm, I'm of the opinion... Uh, my, my entire worldview is shaped by this phrase. Wouldn't it be cool if... I mean, I think that all the time. Wouldn't it be cool if this happens? Um, I would love it if that happened. I think that would be great. Uh, uh, Quinton Shibusawa. Shibusawa? Shibusawa? Uh, one or two. Hey, John and friends. I've seen a few people bring up casting rumors for Doctor Strange and have talked about the actors saying they aren't in them. Some have wrote in saying, it's like the I'm not the werewolf, which you didn't understand. It's a reference to an interview that Andrew Garfield did where he compared people asking him about Spider-Man to someone asking if you're the werewolf, to which you would say, I'm not the werewolf. Hope it clears it up if someone brings it up again. I like that, but you know what I think that's also a reference to? There's that game, the uh, the game of werewolf that you play, you know, with People, it's, 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 it's like, it's, I don't know if it's on cards or board game where someone is the werewolf and you have to figure out who it is. I think that's what Andrew Garfield was referring to. So I'm, I'm with you there, Quentin. With you there. K-Rock, K-Rock sends in a tip and says, look at all the cameos these greedy ass fans want in Doctor Strange too. As long as Patrick Stewart's Professor X is in there, the other members of the Illuminati can be the Wu-Tang Clan for all I care. Bro, come on. I would love to see the Wu-Tang Clan and the Illuminati, <laughs> and they all break into song. Killmonger, MBJ, is Black Panther in it? Possibly. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I here's the thing. We've talked about it on the show. I, I don't want these cameos to overshadow the movie, and it looks like, luckily, the movie seems pretty focused on Stephen Strange and the, the ramifications of his actions and whatever's going on with Wanda and the dark hold and everything i'm there for it it looks great to me but i think you're right i mean cameos are fun but only in the service of the story the great thing about the villains and and the the three spider-man in in no way home is that w with toby spider-man and uh andrew spider-man they they really having all three of them really created an emotional core to the story and it really it matters and it it packs an emotional punch that was that came out of them all, both being there, and I think that's really, um, I think it's really important, and it's it was it's really good too. So you want that to happen, um, you want it to mean something. So I don't want to see a bunch of cameos for cameos' sake. Like look at that guy, look at that guy, look at her. I really want there to be a reason for these cameos and story driven. As long as it's story driven, I'm 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 there for it. Suthius, how are you, sir? With the theory involving Wanda saying no more mutants sometime in the past, my question is when? When would she have done that? As a child in the 90s, hundreds of thousands of years ago as a different individual, how much do we know about her past? Well, Suthius, I think we don't know much at all. All we really know, we really got a glimpse of her past in WandaVision. We, we have a time frame, and maybe she had twins in her younger days. We really don't know much about it. I mean, she's not that old, so you know maybe it maybe i think the idea of of it happening in 2008 definitely could be a possibility because endgame i think we're in in the marvel cinematic universe we're like in 2024 now so maybe if she had kids younger it depends how, wa how old wanda is i'm not sure um you know what i can actually right now as we're talking 
Uh, let's see. How old is Elizabeth Olsen in real life? She is... Uh, she's 33 years old. So... Mm, that's tough. I don't know. Uh, but she was snapped. She's Let's say she's 33 now. She was snapped for five years. So it could work out if she had kids in her early 20s. Mm, I don't know. Could be interesting. But we don't know enough about her past. I want to know, though. Raiden X says, hey, guys, have you seen the trailer for The Boys animated spinoff called The Boys Diabolical? It has a bunch of name actors voicing it. I re recommend checking it out. Well, Raiden, we talked about it. Uh, you know, it's done by uh, Titmouse that did Metalocalypse that the late, great John Schnepp worked for. I was actually, I've been to the Titmouse offices visiting John. Um, I didn't think it looked great. I hope it's great. I want it to be great because uh, I love the boys. But we shall see. Hopefully it's good. Suthius says, I rewatched the Arishem scene at the end of Eternals over and over and over. I don't think Arishem made himself actually visible to Earth, only the Eternals. I watched as the background characters in that park act confused, not surprised or shocked. That could be, uh, Suthius goes on to say, of seeing a huge metallic being in the sky. I believe they did see the clouds part and definitely felt that gu gush gust of wind, but they didn't actually see him. Even Dane was a little confused, and he wasn't directly looking into the sky. Therefore, I don't think Earthlings know about the Celestials just yet. As far as their ever-looming conflict with Earth... I think the Eternals will take care of that. I don't think the Celestials will be the next big problem. I do hope they bring up Tiamat's body, though. Uh, I, you know what? Uh, these are all good questions. You know, I, 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 that could very well be. You could totally be right. The way I, well, you know, I've been talking about the cosmology of Eternals on my own channel a lot, and that's what I really liked. But you could be right about that because... I, I, as I said, if the Celestials showed up, I mean, it would be a game changer in terms of all the religions of the world would have been thrown into chaos. And and even a Celestial coming out, I mean, every archaeologist, every scientist, they're going to be heading out to where that Celestial was emerging. What are they going to make of it? I mean, what can you imagine? This thing was coming out of the earth. What is this thing? I mean, it's not made of any earthly metals and it turned to stone i guess we don't know the science behind it but either way if they could see the celestial or not there's still a celestial that uh tiamat came out of yeah his body what what what's going on uh i don't know i don't know um i really want to know because i've been thinking about the cosmology in the eternals for a long time and what does it all mean and I don't know, and I, I, I really wish, I'm like, can you give us like 10 more minutes of the movie and like show us some like talk shows in the Marvel Cinematic Universe and show how the Earth is responding to a giant celestial emerging from the planet? Like, I'm sure scientists would have been like, you know, if it had come all the way out, it would have cracked the planet in half or some such thing. Tar Heels 65 says, <laughs> great news, John and Rob. I'm able to save my marriage and my hot toys by selling my plasma for money. Do you guys save the boxes for your hot toys or throw them away? Do you think by keeping the boxes it will increase the value of the figures over time? Thanks, Tar Heels. You have just brought up one of the great questions that I ponder on a daily basis. Do I keep my hot toys boxes? I have various friends that collect hot toys. Some do and some don't. Here's the thing. Many hot toys do increase in value. And they're the most valuable when you have the boxes in good condition. And, you know, boxes like, for instance, look at this. So this is not a hot toy. Uh, but look at this. Look at this box. I mean, as a matter of fact, you know, what? I'm going to go full frame on this for you. So uh, this, this is a third party figure. But look at the box. I mean, it, it's really heavy, it's it's very thick, and it's like, it's art in itself. Now, this this figure, it's spot UV printed. This figure, those of you who are looking at it going, what is that figure? This figure, Ghost of Battlefield is what it's called. But I know, you get pissed if I didn't open it, right? So I'm going to open it and show you what it is. 
Remember, this is an unlicensed, call it a bootleg figure. This is one of the greatest figures, to be honest, one of the greatest figures I've ever seen. This is an unbelievable Ghosts, Ghost of Tsushima figure. It's insane. There you can sell the weapons, the body. I mean, and this is a double-decker box. It's got, it's, it's insane. It might be uh, easily one of my favorite figures of last year. And the question is, um, do you get rid of the boxes? Obviously, that has a really nice box. And when you resell them, you have to put them in the box, and they're worth a lot more money. Now, I'm never going to resell my figures. I, I just won't do it because I love my figures. But one day I'm going to be dead. <laughs> and my next of kin is going to be like, what are we going to do with all these? And it would be better if they had the boxes to put them all away and sell them. Or maybe, maybe you know, if I'm dying of terminal cancer or something, I'll sell them. I'll put them on eBay. That'll be my last act in the world. So to be honest, so far, I save most of my boxes. I save most of my boxes. So, um, the, but the problem is, they're, those boxes are big. Like, where are you going to store them? Like, I uh, I can see right now, I'm probably looking at, because uh, I have the shelves above me, there's hot toys and boxes all around the top of, and all throughout this. I'm, I'm the Rob Servitory is actually a garage, a two-car garage, but there's no cars in it. It's just all my stuff. There's probably, I would say, 50, 50, 50 hot toys figures that I haven't even opened. <laughs> They're all up there. I know it's sad and pathetic, but um, and I'm putting more and more away. I should open them because it's sad not to have your hot toys open. But there you go. Uh, Raid Next says I just ordered the Hot Toys one six scale Carnage from the movie. Can't wait. Well, Raid Next, that figure looks awesome, and um, if you if you haven't got the Venom yet, the Venom is great, great. The Blue Raja. Oh, nice reference. Hey, John Rob, have you read Sex Criminals? Universal bought the rights to 2015 for a show, but it fizzled. It's prime for HBO Max. In short, when the main character climaxes, she freezes time and uses powers to rob banks and sex police. Give it a read. Well, I would love that. <laughs> I have not read it, but I'll read that. Sounds like it's right up my alley. Uh, Tomas sends in a tip and says, The Elvis trailer looked awesome. I thought it did too. And John and I are Baz Luhrmann fans, so count us in. Tom Petty put it best. The legacy of Elvis is that he made the obscure music style of rock and roll and made it mainstream. He's the first artist that did everything right and everything wrong of the rock superstar trappings. <clears throat> Tomas, you're obviously right. I mean, Elvis, the bad boy of rock, he obviously made women fly into a tizzy and made men want to be him. And so they could make women fly into a tizzy too. I, it looks great to me. I mean, who doesn't love Elvis? We all love Elvis, right? Uh, Ava C sends, will the box office results for Uncharted hurt Tom Holland's negotiation for more Spider-Man films? Not at all, Eva. Um, nothing could. Tom Holland is Spider-Man and, uh, oh, he, 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 he can't be hurt, um, by, by that at all. Can't be hurt. Uh, perfectly legal blockade sends in a tip and says, when Scarlet Witch appeared in the Doctor Strange Multiverse of Mad tra Madness trailers, I was like, now there are two of them. Yeah, man, I, I, there are two of them. <laughs> what, what is going to happen? I don't know, but I am so there for it. Um, by the way, great name, and thanks for the support. I, I, I just, how great does that movie look? I mean, it looks cr uh, like, put me on the train to crazy town. It looks amazing. Cannot wait. Cannot wait. Aubrey. Sends in a tip and says, could the Deadpool cameo in Multiverse of Madness happen like the Venom one in Spider-Man? The movie ends and at the end credit is Deadpool breaking the fourth wall, announcing he's in the MCU now. <coughs> well, it could, but, you know, I don't even think he necessarily has to break the fourth wall. They could, he could be skipping through the multiverse and then get caught up in something. I could see that happening. I mean, John seems pretty convinced and I'm pretty convinced that he's not going to be in the movie, but I go back to my philosophy wouldn't it be cool if he was? I think it would be. But he could definitely do that. You know, I just don't think he would just show up and go, I'm in the MCU now. I think you could do something really cool with Deadpool, but I don't know if they would bring Deadpool into the MCU 
Although, if Wanda brings all the mutants back to the MCU, Deadpool would be one of them. So that that could happen. That could happen. I think. Just your average Jose sends in a tip and says one of two. It seems that the MCU is really leaning into comic book storytelling. You have the multiverse story that may potentially continue in Ant-Man 3, the cosmic threat in Arishem the Judge, which can be touched upon in 4 Thor, Guardians, or the Marvels, a supernatural element that may begin in Moon Knight and continue with Blade and Black Knight, and lastly, the Earth-level events coming in Invasion and Armor Wars, Secret Invasion. It's going to be interesting to see how it will all come together or not. Just your average Jose, uh, or Jose, I'm with you there. I, and I, you know, as a longtime comic book fanatic, I mean, you can't really tell, but this level on my books, my bookcase, all the way around are all omnibuses and hardcovers, and beneath me are absolute editions, and I'm a huge comic book fan, been been comic book fan my whole life, so I can't wait for it all. And I think, you know, as long as I, I think you're, you, you have aired a concern that a lot of us have, which is, are they going to allow this to spin out into oblivion? I hope not. I mean, that's always a, that's always a concern. You can't go, you can't go, you can't go full comic, <laughs> you know, if you go full comic, you can't go full comic. If you go full comic, it can get a little wacky. And the thing about the MCU is it really threads a thin line or, or it threads a needle or, or a needle thread. What's the, what's, you know what I mean? If you tie thread and you needle, use a needle to whatever I'm trying to say, <laughs> I'm, I'm clearly not remembering it, but threading that needle, that's what it was. You're threading, it's, it's a thin line regardless between the reality of the MCU and the comic book-ness of it all. And I think What's really great is the MCU is firmly set in the real world. So all the comic book stuff, the the heroes, the villains, the creatures, the aliens, it all kind of extends out from a reality as opposed to, say, in Tim Burton's Batman, clearly it's not the world we live in. It's it's an Anton first production design zany world that isn't as grounded in reality as our own. So I think that's one of the strengths of the Marvel Cinematic Universe is that it, it begins from, quote-unquote, reality. And when we went back and watched Iron Man for Movie Club, it was apparent how uh, how grounded in the real world it was, and it made the Iron Man shenanigans going on that much more believable, which I think was great. But I think your concern is valid. If it spins off into too, too, too much comic book stuff, we'll lose what makes the MCU special. Travis James R. sends in a tip and says, can we also get a Force movie? I know they tried, and oh, can, can we also get an A-Force movie? I know they tried to float an all-female team in Endgame. Weird scene, but I still think with She-Hulk and Captain Marvel, we can get A-Force. Um, I, I don't see why not. I mean, you know, if there's a reason to do that, but, you know, it's funny. A lot of people have complained about that scene. I just thought it was kind of cool acknowledging all the female characters it happened so briefly but it was cool i had no problem with that i i it didn't diminish the male characters at all you just had all these female characters in one scene and to me it's like look you you've got girl power you need you need it to defeat thanos we need everybody all hands on deck and uh in that moment you realize it didn't matter whether heroes were male or female you just needed heroes and they all stood together in opposition of Thanos. And I, I thought it was really cool. And I would I would love to see an A-Force movie. Why not? I think it'd be cool. Again, great stories and great characters. Ann Perkins sends in a tip and says, Last week I gave in. And I watched Peacemaker from some random online source. Hmm. I'm sorry, but watching you guys and Twitter hyping it each week got the better of me. I'll rewatch it or pay for it if it ever comes to the U.A., to the UA, to the UK, to replace my illegal watching, though. But did you like it, Ann? Did you like it? Uh, thanks for supporting the channel, but I want to know what you thought. But I'm glad you saw it from some random online source. Hopefully, you used ExpressVPN, one of the sponsors of this channel. Uh, Jalon Bolton. Jalon Bolton says, Hey, guys, I've been a viewer since the AMC days. John would say, well, Thanks, man. That's great. 
Uh, do you think Tom Holland should try and take a Timothy Chalamet approach to picking his movie roles instead of trying to be the action hero leading man like Uncharted? Yes. I think uh, showing versatility in your abilities is always a good thing. So I think that would indeed be a good way to go for Mr. Tom Holland. I got to say, you know, um, I really thought he acquitted himself admirably in Uncharted. I was dubious. I thought he was great. I totally bought him as young Nathan Drake. I just wish he had a better script. I really do. Winter Naomi Vera says, I mean, it's been confirmed that Harcourt's returning in Black Adam. I don't know if this was before the first episode was written or after, but I'm pretty sure that's why she survived. Also, do you think the Squad franchise should continue on HBO Max? Yes. Harcourt, I would imagine, great character, why not? But I I do, you know, what's interesting, I think when the history of Hollywood is written, you're going to go back and, and like I said to John, I mean, you couldn't do it continuity-wise, but if Peacemaker had come out first, it might have really helped the Suicide Squad movie. Um, because I think people are going to go back and rediscover Suicide Squad after watching Peacemaker, which I think is terrific. I mean, I, I really liked Peacemaker a lot. It was so much fun. It was kind of all over the place, but I really liked it. It was just wildly entertaining like Peacemaker was. But um, I think it should continue. I think there should be more Peacemaker and bring more of those characters back. Uh, I would love a history of King Shark, maybe a one-shot or something. <laughs> maybe. Uh, Mark Amorosi sends in a tip and says, I love the Peacemaker finale so much. This is hands down the best DC, DC show I've ever seen. Mark, you will get no argument from me. It is... It, wildly entertaining it was all over the place i love the body r-rated humor i it was just it was just terrific i loved it loved it loved it and um i think everybody loved it <laughs> i mean what was so crazy about it was you just didn't know what was going to happen next so much fun so much fun tomas sends in a tip and says i think it will take a very long time until steve rogers returns to the mcu if Steve returns too soon, it could invalidate Falcon's version of Cap before he gets to be Cap. With the sensitive racial discussion in America, it could result in controversy. Uh, that's a great Prince song. Uh, I love that song. And I love the album. I think you're absolutely right. Look, one of the things I really loved about Falcon and the Winter Soldier is I, I have no problem having conversations about America's complex racial history. And let's face it. We are a very racist, I'll even say it now, we're still a very racist nation down to our core. And the fact that Sam Wilson, a black man, would step up and assume the mantle of Captain America knowing that m many people in this country would hate him for it or wouldn't accept a black Captain America um, shows what kind of courage Sam Wilson actually has. And I really like that. And even when talking to a man who had been screwed over by the United States, I mean, it was... The, the, the debate that was going on in that show made it really, I thought, very worthwhile. And I think you're absolutely right. I think Sam Wilson, need, we need to see him step up and, and be Captain America. He's never going to be Steve Rogers. He's going to be something new, something different, something that represents perhaps something we'd never seen before. And I think I really was there for it. I really like Falcon the Winter Soldier. Was it perfect? No. But I really did enjoy it, and I really loved Anthony Mackie's portrayal and the the transition he makes, like coming to grips with the fact that he alone has to make the decision to be Cap and that he does. That's, that the fact that he would take the mantle on of Captain America knowing many people that he represents are going to hate him, that's true heroism. And I, I love that. I thought it was great. Luke1234 says... Piggybacking, uh, piggybacking on your No More Mutants dead children theory. I think Wanda used so much chaos magic, she gave herself amnesia, which then took years to recharge, and the Mind Stone was the spark to start the recharging process, giving off a false miracle. I mean, that could be. That could be. You know, I look over here, I can't reach it, but I've got my House of M hardcovers over there. And I just, I always, I think back to the fact that Kevin Feige always goes back to the comics for inspiration. And I could definitely see them getting into that. But um, that could be, it could be. But I always, I always tend to go back to the comics and say, if that's, that's probably where the answers lie. 
Um, but I, I think what you're proposing, Luke, is is plausible, could be. Uh, I think we're going to find out, or at least if we don't get all the answers, we're going to get some of the answers in Multiverse of Madness. Dangerous D sends in a tip and says, Hi, John. I have theories for season two of Peacemaker. Wow. Gothel inhabits someone and join Task Force X. I would love that. The question should pop up. I I could totally see the question joining the team or being part of it. James Gunn would do great things with the question. Uh, the question should pop up. Vigilante and Peacemaker do a five-minute bit on what happened to his face. <laughs> I, I, that would be hilarious. Prometheus, who killed Peacemaker in the comics, is the bad guy. Ooh, that's a really good idea. Dangerous D, I like where you're coming from with this. I could see all of those things happening. Uh, Blake sends in a tip and says, there's a YouTube video of Elvis singing Unchained Melody live right before he died. I think it's what's in the trailer. He looks so sick and unwell, but somehow summoned this song. Check it out if you haven't seen it. That trailer gave me chills. Blake gave me chills too. And uh, I, I'm a sucker. I am a sucker for sports movies and musical biopics. Even though I'm not musical and I, I don't know much about sports. But I love sports movies and musical biopics. So I'm there for it. Um, I can't wait. Cannot wait. It looks so good. Baz Luhrmann, man. Do the can, can, can. I can't wait. Can't wait. Gerudo sends in a tip and says, The Batman is officially labeled as an AMC artisan film. We were talking about that earlier this week. Looking at the website of this award, it is mainly Oscar-winning films that receive this distinction. And this gives hope that with the new incarnation of Batman, we are not dealing with a typical blockbuster. Gerudo, I hope you're correct. I mean, I think we all here have been uh, pretty stoked, obviously, about the Batman. It looks, I mean, it looks epic epic i can't wait um you know i'm expecting some godfather 2 level uh of storytelling you know really i want to go deep i want to go long i want to uh i want to uh i just i i hope it's really an epic tale you know i I, i've said i want it to be like a fincher movie like like the girl with the dragon tattoo meets seven meets meets zodiac meets the godfather (laughs) can i have that please (laughs) <laughs> and with a superhero sprinkling on top. That's what I'm looking for. So I'm stoked, man. Uh, Vodder. Vodder sends in a tip and says, What do you think of Steven Soderbergh calling out superhero movies for their lack of sex? Nobody's fucking. Personally, I don't think it's necessary. I don't need to see these characters take shits to know that they probably take shits. Vodder, you, you bring up a good point. I mean, for me... <clears throat> yeah, can you imagine... If if in every if in every single movie we had to watch people take a dump or at least go into the bathroom and wait till they came back, I mean, I, personally for me, I like I like to take a long time in there. I read. Uh, it's quiet time. I always have books in the bathroom. Sometimes I stay in there a lot longer than I take to do my business because it's quiet. Nobody bothers you, and I like to read. In my house, there's a lot of activity going on all the time, whether it's dogs or Elizabeth or her girls, and it's hard to get. <laughs> maybe that's too much information about me but anyway no i think your point is well is well handled but i think you know i think the actual act of sex i mean we've seen sex in peacemaker we've seen it in the boys all that i think what what uh soderberg was saying that a lot of superhero movies sort of shy away from more adult activity and i don't mean like x-rated boom chicka bow bow activity i mean like I get what they're saying, like, but the thing is, here's what I find frustrating about um, about a lot of this criticism of uh, superhero movies. You know, I like all kinds of movies from all around the world, and um, I think that what these filmmakers are saying when they're criticizing superhero movies is they have become so dominant, and let's face it, I mean, superhero characters are characters that are deeply rooted in our childhoods and as much as look i love the marvel cinematic universe i love dc movies i love superheroes because i grew up with them but i also like movies that are non-superheroic i mean one of my favorite movies like i love movies like jerry Maguire and almost famous you know i love comedies like i love you man or the 40 year old virgin or get him to the greek 
or Blazing Saddles or Animal House. I like those too. But I also like, you know, for existential foreign films from the 60s, like my beloved Ennui trilogy from Antonioni, La Note, La, uh, La Ventura and the Eclipse, or a movie like Last Year at Marion Bad, you know, which is essentially an art film, or, or uh, Truffaut's The 400 Blows, or Tarkovsky's Solaris, or Stalker. You know, I like all, I like all different kinds of films in my diet. And I think when superhero movies are dominating our landscape, we're also, we're missing as film fans the, the, the beauty of the myriad different kinds of movies that get made. Because now in the American studio landscape, they're only making IP flights of fancy movies. And I think that they're not making, like, look, one of my favorite movies of all time is Paul Newman in The Verdict, which is kind of a quiet story about an alcoholic lawyer who's looking for redemption. And while we see these kinds of stories on streaming, that was a big studio movie that I went to see in the theater, and I miss that. I miss that. But I, I think in terms of, of having sex, to me, unless a sex scene is is somehow uh, the, 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 the sex is intrinsic to the plot, like, for instance, I think in Basic Instinct, the sex scenes, as great as they are, because Sharon Stone's a beautiful woman, they're also very, they're, they're titillating and, and arousing, but they also are suspenseful. Is she going to kill Michael Douglas while they're having sex and drive an ice pick into his face? So even though they're sexy, on one hand, they turn you on. But on the other hand, it becomes a suspense scene. Or, you know, if you're watching a movie that is about the erotic power, like you watch Body Heat, Lawrence Kasdan's first feature, Body Heat, that he directed, when Kathleen Turner seduces William Hurt, you know, the the fact that she is is pleasuring him in ways that he can't resist is integral to the plot, and that seduction is what allows her to cast a, a spell over him and, and make him do her bidding. So I think in that case, it, it, it matters to the plot, but a lot of the time it doesn't. Sex scenes are just there for titillation. There's nothing wrong with that, but um, I don't necessarily think it always helps the pacing. So if sex scenes matter, I think they're great. If they don't, if you just throw it in there because you want to see some boobs or see some naked people grinding, sometimes it can be gratuitous and it just brings the, the movie to a halt and I don't think that's good for anyone. So Juju Media Corps sends in a tip and says, Theory, since in the sacred timeline Tony invented time travel in the MCU, a superior Iron Man with three stones could invent multiversal travel. Ooh. Chavez and Strange falling into the multiverse, into the Iron Legion universe. Iron Man takes the Illuminati with other variants. That's a really interesting idea. Uh, I can see that happening. Or maybe uh, uh, the superior Iron Man, that's how he was able to get to join the Illuminati in the first place. I like the way you're thinking, so Juju. Uh, that's, uh, that's a good theory. We'll see, we'll see how, how, how it uh, plays out. Uh, Serene says the review embargo lifts on 228 for the Batman, which is only four days prior to the movie's release. Should we be concerned as that can indicate negative for a movie? On the other hand, Warner Brothers has the early fan screenings, which shows confidence. I want this to be good so badly. Well, Serene, you're not the only one. Look, they've already shown it to press. So the remember the embargo lifts, but they're already showing it to people. So word is out. And uh, Jimmy Kimmel even said when he had Robert Pattinson on the other night how much he liked the movie. So hopefully it will be fantastic. We shall see. Uh, and I want it to be good as bad as you do. Chloe Fanning sends in a tip and says, Wishful thinking here, but I would like them to do another series like Highlander the Raven. But this time they stay in the same time period within each episode. With each episode focusing on that time period, but the Raven only lasted one season. Cheers. Yeah, it wasn't the greatest. I like the idea, though. Isn't Henry Cavill going to play the new Connor McCloud in the remake of Highlander? Because that'd be pretty dope, wouldn't it? I think it'd be dope. I think it'd be uh, fantastic. I'd love it. I think it'd be great. Uh, oh, no, it's Josiah. Is it Josiah? Josiah? Uh, oh, my God, John. Catwoman's theme in The Batman is incredible. Michael Giacchino, Giacchino as to be one of the best in the business. So what Oh No, It's Josias is talking about, they just dropped a third track from the Batman soundtrack. It is the jazzy Catwoman theme, and it is incredible. You are not wrong. I loved it. I cannot wait to buy the score. It's amazing. 
a really good stuff. You are right. He's killing it with his score. And it's so different than what I expected. It's not like the the propulsive, fierce music Hans Zimmer did for uh, Nolan's trilogy. And it's different than like the junky XL music uh, that uh, was with Snyder or um, the Zimmer music from, from uh, Dark Knight. I mean, from uh, Man of Steel. It's something different. Man, I love it. Some old guy in Hollywood sends in a tip and says, Hey, JC, don't think Feige meant no more films featuring Avengers of some sort. Listen in at the 219 mark of the Shang-Chi main theme, which plays over the end credits. One doesn't drop that into the score by accident. Aloha and bring on the filthy. What is that? Do I have to turn and be like uh, Boromir? One doesn't just drop an Avengers theme. Um, you're probably right about that. I Look. As I said on the show, they're going to make Avengers 5 and 6 and 7 and 8. Uh, I expect in 2025 we're going to get the fifth Avengers movie. How can you not do that? You have to do that. You have to make it. It has to be done. Ethan Holgate, one of four. Hi, John and Rob. As a fanatic of the Uncharted games, I didn't mind this movie adaptation. It's not great or perfect, but they got a lot right from the game story and tone wise even though i have several issues with it for me it's a fairly good solid seven out of ten well that's good even goes on to say and in my defense of the casting of tom holland and mark Wahlberg, they actually are accurate casting from a young standpoint because in my opinion they look like they could be a young nate and sully from the third game there's a flashback and they resemble i think that's you know what i will grant you that you're right about that okay my big issue with the movie is that it just wasn't good enough because all six games are incredible beyond words. I agree with you. I've only played four. And I just wish they made this movie a much different way. Because there was a lot of potential here to make something incredible. But Ethan finally finishes it off and says, But they made something good, which is fair at the end of the day. And it is what it is. But I still like the movie. And if they get to make sequels, I'm curious to see what they're going to do next. Just hope they have a different director and a much better script. Um... Yeah, I, I think Ethan, you know, I've talked a lot about it on the show and last night. I, I just thought it was really uninspired. And, you know, the idea of the the um, the Uncharted uh, games, I, I keep going back to, I want to say I played the first one in 2006, 2006 or probably, two, actually, no, it's probably 2007, did it come out in 2007? I was blown away by that first game. And when I played it, I loved the backgrounds and the environments. There was there was a sense of wonder in there. And I I thought like half of the movie, like running around Barcelona, they even made Barcelona's an incredible city and they made it boring. I just didn't believe it. It wasn't inspired, it wasn't interesting. I mean, I made the joke earlier this morning before we went on that this movie wasn't uncharted, it was charted. They had charts telling you where to go, everywhere. And um, I, I just, it, everything was so easy. Uh, I, look, I liked the dangling off the plane. That was cool. Right, you know, I recognized that from the game right away, obviously. But it just didn't have any magic or wonder in it for me. And I remember, you know, the game cast this spell of wonder. It's like, wow, this is so cool. It was so mesmerizing playing that game. And I, I just, I wished it had more like that. So like you... It was all right, but it should have been much, 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 much better. Uh, Jay Wins says, so guys, with a new season of Peacemaker guaranteed and basically everyone dead in the show other than the main team, are we getting a brand new intro dance? I would think so. Maybe even a new song? I love this intro, so it'll be hard to replace. What are your thoughts? Well, Jay Wins, uh, I want to taste it again, but I think that um, they kind of would have to do that. I hope they do. Do a whole new dance. And we joked, maybe they'll do a square dance the next season. Please, I don't want them to do that. I don't want them to do a river dance either. But if they did, I'd still watch it because I'm sure it would be hilarious. Um, but I I, uh, I, I think they're going to have to. Because they're going to have a whole new cast of characters. You know, I just, I, it still has to end with Eagly coming in. and Because I love Eagly coming in at the end. They gotta, or maybe they'll do something new with Eagly. I don't know. But they have to. They have to do the dance. They have to do the dance. The Dark Nerd sends in a tip and says, I saw an article today saying Michael Rosenbaum wants to be in Peacemaker Season 2. 
I know, big shocker, actor wants role, but I'm a big Smallville fan, so I'm excited. I haven't started watching Peacemaker yet, but I might have to if he shows up. Who will he play? Ooh, good question. Um, I don't know. I have no idea who he's going to play. I, but I have to tell you, I'm a huge Michael Rosenbaum fan. One of my favorite things to watch is his show on YouTube, where he interviews a lot of other actors and people that he knows, and uh, he's great. I, I'm a huge fan of Michael Rosenbaum. I liked him as an actor. I liked him as Luther, but I, I really like him as a person, and he's a big nerd. If you look, he's got the old sideshow Indiana Jones figure from 16, 17 years ago, the quarter scale figure. He's got that right there. He's got an Evil Dead poster. Um, he's great. I love Michael Rosenbaum. He can play with whoever he wants. <laughs> Bring him up. <laughs> I want him on the show. I think that's a great idea. Uh, Michael H. Jones sends in a tip, one of two. You want to hear from someone who has seen Blacklight? Okay, it's awful. Oh, really? This is coming from someone who likes the Liam Neeson mo Liam Neeson's movies. I, I think everyone loves that Key and Peele sketch. It's so good. I find them entertaining, but this one, the villain, head of the FBI, sends six men's six men's to fight Neeson. <laughs> and that's right, only six. And when Neeson defeats them, he gives up. This movie plays like an old network movie of the week. Ooh, bad story and characters, but it's an underdog story, so all's forgiven. It is god-awful. Oh, Michael H., right through the heart, buddy. You're getting me right there, right through the heart. Oh. But you know what? Uh, he's a much better actor. you got to give him more time to do something good. You really do. Uh, it's too bad. I wish it was a better movie. It's uh, distressing to hear that. I don't like that it's got awful. Scott Brown sends in a tip and says, Do you think we'll see any of the main characters from these Star Wars video games show up in live action? Uh, Aiden Versio or Cal Kestis? I really like both characters and the time would fit for Obi-Wan and the Mandalorian. The actors could just reprise their roles. Maybe. I mean, look, I think they're doing a pretty good job. I, I don't know those characters. Uh, I know Cal Kestis. Do I know? Do I know? I didn't, why am I not saying it right? Uh, Versio. Um, look, man, I, I'm still waiting for uh, Dash Rendar. <laughs> Come on, bring him back. Where's Dash Rendar? I'm so old. But... Um, uh, why not? I mean, they're 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 consciously bringing back all these characters and putting them all together. I think it's, I think it's pretty awesome when they do that, um, and it, I, it it solidifies the universe. I mean, why not? I I definitely could see that happening. Absolutely. Not the wolf sends in a tip and says, "Hi, John. I just saw your video on Ryan Reynolds. If there's a moment where Deadpool could appear without shifting the tone, it would be on that multiverse traveling sequence we saw in the trailer. Hell, there's an animated reality in the trailer. That's wacky. Dude, I am with you 100%. I mean, it is the multiverse of madness. I think Deadpool can show up how he shows up. Because remember, he doesn't have to be, he doesn't always have to break the fourth wall. He could do something wacky in universe with Doctor Strange. I mean, it could be. There's ways to do it. I think uh, if anybody could figure it out, Ryan Reynolds could, and I, I'm sure Kevin Feige could. So I think it could happen, but I don't know if it's going to. I just, I, I think you have to introduce the X Men first. I don't know. Um, but then again, both Deadpool movies together made a billion and a half dollars. So why not? Why not? But we'll see. I mean, I think it's all about the tone. You know, you're correct. It is all about the tone. And would the tone disrupt the film or not? I don't know. It's hard to say. Scott Brown, one of two. You were talking about the best movie openings ever. One of my favorites is Blade. I knew nothing about the character when I saw it with the music and the blood raining down from the ceiling. Blade walks in and draws a line in the blood with his sword and commences to kick ass and was I was in, and I became a Blade fan for life. Man, I love that movie. It has some of the best fight scenes, like when he goes into a blood rage mode at the end. That's how you open a movie with a fairly unknown character. Scott, I knew Blade, and I still thought they're playing that New Order remix. You know, and the the DJ with the lights. You know, and he reaches his arms out. That opening kicks major boute. And for those of you who have never seen Blade, it's not a perfect movie. And to be honest, 
the CG is 25 years now, almost 25 years uh, out. So a lot of the CG is a little ropey because it was, you know, new back then. And certainly the blood god at the end of the movie was a little lackluster. But I love Blade. Um, yes, it's a little theatrical, but it is awesome. And Blade 2 is good, too. Uh, different kind of movie, but Guillermo del Toro's Blade 2 is worth seeing. But yeah, man, I'm with you 100%. That shit was dope. Loved it. And guess what, kids? That brings me to the end of your questions. And you know what I just realized? I have been doing this, and I forgot to go back to where you could see your questions. I've been reading these questions. I went all the way back. I I forgot to switch back. I hope you're all not angry with me that you couldn't see your questions. <laughs> Oops. You know what? I, I showed you my Ghost of Tsushima figure, and I never switched back to the questions. Oh, man, I hope John doesn't get mad. But um, I profusely apologize in not, not letting you see your questions. I did read them all. They're here. So I hope that's okay with y'all, <laughs> that you didn't see the questions. I hope I don't get in trouble for that. Um, but, hey, you got to see the Ghost of Tsushima figure. That must have been something. That's worth something, right? Let's... Uh, Let's go back, and I'll just uh, go through these so you can see them all. I'll just read everybody's questions back. I don't know how far back I was. I think to about here. <laughs> so, Travis James R., Ann Perkins, Jalam Bolton, Winter Naomi Vera, Mark Amorosi, Tomas, um, Luke1234, Dangerous D, uh, Blake, uh, Gerudo, Vauder, Sojuju Media Corps, uh, Serene, Chloe Fanning. Oh no, it's Josiah or Josiah, Josiah. Hey JC, that's from some old guy in Hollywood, Ethan Holgate, which was one of four. Thank you, Ethan Holgate. Uh, Jay Wins and uh, the Dark Nerd, Michael H. Jones. Send in one of two of two. Scott Brown, not the Wolf. Scott Brown one of two and Scott Brown two of two. That's how we finish it off. So I, I hope, see, see, I try and do something cool and I screw it up, but I hope everybody didn't mind that. You got to see my awesome Ghost of Tsushima figure, you know, which I don't usually get to get, you know what, since I screwed up, uh, no, no, I, I, I already screwed up enough. John's probably going to be pissed. Like, Rob, why didn't you do that? Anyway, hope you're not mad. I want to thank everybody. For now, now let me go back full frame. <laughs> let me thank everybody, all of you, for generously supporting the channel via super chats and tips. We really appreciate it. I mean, remember, part of the greatness of this channel is you guys. The community that we've built here at the John Campy Show means so much to all of us. Um, so the whole team, whether it's Ray, whether it's Aaron, whether it's Chris, whether it's me, and of course, our grand poobah, John Campia himself. We want to thank you from the bottom of our hearts for supporting the channel, and this ends another episode of Mailbag, and I probably will never show another action figure on this show again. So thanks very much. I very much appreciate everything you do for us, and hopefully we'll be able to continue on for years bringing you fine entertainment. So this brings an end to tonight's Mailbag.